Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Um, first, I want to say, <clears throat> pardon me, my condolences on mom and grandma. Oh, thank, thank you. you. How long has it been since she passed? She passed uh, June 26th. It was a okay. Tuesday. It was a Tuesday, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, my dad passed away March 2nd last year, which is why I'm ending up dealing with my mom a lot more than I had in the past. Right. Right. So why don't you, what was grandma mom's name? Donna. Donna. Why don't you tell me about Donna and her a little bit about her life and who she was? Uh, well, she was, um, a creative woman. Uh, she, Mm -hmm. she worked as a, um, admin type of position most of her life, very organized, very creative. And, uh, she loved the holidays and she loved having family, um, around. And, uh, I think probably around the time that they decided to retire, I think we started noticing that she was having memory issues, but they weren't bad. They weren't bad at all. The occasional like repeat of a question here and there, you know, and we, yeah, we would start noticing that like grandma already asked about that. Didn't she? You know? Right. Right. But I, it, it just wasn't anything that we were overly concerned about. Mm -hmm. And she had health issues. She had asthma as a child and there were um, a lot of surgeries and things that she endured through her life. Um, the last thing that she endured was a um, kind of an emergency surgery for a hiatal hernia, mm-hmm. which they don't usually do surgery for, but hers was yeah. so bad that um, she had to, to go through that. And because of all that she went through with that surgery, it sort of pro- it brought on the m- more of a memory issue thing as she was recovering, and that was the beginning of her dementia. Um, It it became more prominent at family gatherings, um, and my dad took it on. He would take her to all of her doctor appointments and then started with neurologists Mm -hmm. to have her diagnosed eventually with vascular dementia. And they attributed it to what she went through in that surgery, but she was already going down that road. It just sort of made it happen faster. Um, I kind of that, suspect something similar happened to my mom. Mm-hmm. She was involved in a serious car accident in December of 91. Mm. She hit her face so hard on the steering wheel that the nerve that comes through your cheekbone mm. was permanently damaged. Oh, wow. For a wow. long time, her cheek was numb like Novocaine. Right. Mm. And then it kind of came back like the Novocaine was wearing off, but I don't, I don't know that it ever fully regained normalcy. Mm -hmm. And that was, like I said, December of 91. And looking back, we think she might've actually started showing signs of memory loss in the summer of 1995, Mm -hmm. which put her at about 52 and a half. Mm. Um, My 52nd birthday is in about three weeks. So it's mm. kind of scary. And my maternal grandmother had Alzheimer's. I think it was undiagnosed Alzheimer's. And my maternal great grandmother also had no memory at the end of her life. So it's like, mm. yay for genetics. Yay. For me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a little concerned as well. My grandmother, um, she started having memory issues, but she was, it was later in her life. It was uh, more towards, yeah, I would say maybe 78-ish. And they, my grandfather and her died like maybe five months apart. And my grandfather was also having memory issues, but it wasn't that I'm aware of. I mean, my aunt took care of them, but they were aware up until probably about two, three years prior to their uh, passings. And um, so none of us really thought that this was something to think about. <laughs> And, and it's, it's definitely, um, it's been a journey. Let's just put it that way. It's not Um, a fun journey either. It's not. And, and of course, dad, 
did an excellent job to to take on the caregiving part. He did everything, and we were not aware of basically all that that entailed uh, because it was manageable. Um, Mom, you know, a- as she became more and more dependent on him, and he made sure that he made it easy for her. Uh, you know, to get through her day, to get her to where she needed to be, to get her hair cut and all these things. But it was evident um, at more family gatherings. Every time we'd try and get her to a place, sometimes he'd have to call and say, I cannot get your mother in the car. She's not wanting to do this today. And we would understand. And he would get frustrated and it was just sort of, what's going on here? You know, because he shielded us from a lot of that everyday stuff. Until yeah. about two years ago, where he called my brother and our, myself and um, our spouses in to talk to him, where he finally put up the white flag and said, I cannot do this anymore. It's more than I can handle. So he called in what he fondly calls his committee, in air quotes, <laughs> <The> <laughs> and that we do that, yeah. which uh, we took on the responsibility of finding a place for mom, which is exactly where we started, <laughs> literally at a place for mom, it's a website. Ah, a website. Yeah, and, I've used them. Uh, yes, they mm. were uh, instrumental in getting us guided to where we needed to be. And uh, so we took that on. He had, um, he said, I will take care of her, uh, but I can't do this part. I, I need for you guys to help me. And so we did. And we we got him a bridge, what we called the bridge, where in-home care came in to help him while we took that job on to uh, tour and interview places for mom, literally. Um, and we, we found two, and we brought them back to dad, and then he took it over from there. So it was kind of a, here we go, this is the information, yeah. and um, he, he made the choice of those two, one brought out the evalu- the evaluator and they could not take her because she was too far advanced. The first, wow. the first, place, the first the place that we really wanted to put her. And I don't know if you want me to tell you what that place was, but they only had a certain level of memory care that they could provide. And mom was just a tick farther than they felt they could, um, you know, successfully care for her. So we took um, option B, which was Crescendo and Placentia, where they had a, a brand new memory center along that was hooked into a senior assisted living uh, facility. So we were also looking to see for post this for my dad to say, if you don't want to be staying in the house by yourself once this transitions, maybe you might want to look into getting a condominium on this side so that you're closer to mom. So we had kind of a twofold research that we were doing. He didn't use that, but it was there for him if he chose to do that to cope. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't know sort of, you know, the sort of timeline for grandpa's health right. at that point, you know. He was very depressed he, at this he, point. Yeah, he was going through his own emotional struggle. And I, I think, you know, having the committee, <laughs> as it were, the quote-unquote committee, um, helped to sort of relieve this sort of stress of decision making a, a little bit uh, for for my grandfather. Um, I, I don't know, like, I think I think there's there's a bit of like, when you reach out for help, especially like in a spouse situation, from what I can just get from being sort of an outside viewer of the entire situation, is is that, you know, the decision to put somebody at home, to some can feel like giving up on that person. And sorry. I can see that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, having, you know, the others in your support system uh, be able to look at all of the options and sort of, you know, take into consideration like what would be best for, you know, your, your loved one at that point um, to sort of give you the best decision <laughs> to, to make as opposed to like, you you grappling with this sort of personal idea that, you know, you're, is, does this mean that I'm giving up on my wife? Does this mean that, you know, we're giving up on mom? And then it's further, further from the truth, you know, like the, um, providing somebody with 
the help, putting them in a facility that will be able to give them more than you could give them at home. And I, it is, it like, it's, it's a hard personal struggle, but ultimately better care for my grandmother was going to be had at, at a memory facility. And I think you know? perceptions of uh, care facilities has changed immensely, especially yeah. since my, my dad um, thought about them. You know, they're quite different than they were when maybe um, he would have thought about this for his parents. So oh, that definitely. perception needed to be brought from his children to him saying, wow, <laughs> you know, here are the things that they will provide for mom. And, and we had a stake in making sure. Um, I, my, I know that the committee took great care in you know, talking prior, going together to do the tours, and saying to each other, if for one moment any of you feel uncomfortable in here, for whatever reason, you need to let us know, yeah. and we will leave, and then we will go talk about it. And there was one place that we did have that. Both uh, my sister-in-law and I both looked at each other and shook our heads as we were going through it, and I said, okay, we let them finish the tour, and that one was just off the table. So. Yeah. That's be, when be picky. <clears throat> yes, be yeah, very absolutely. Picky. <clears throat> be be real picky. Um, yes, because you know, they, they, they you want them to care for your parent. You want it to um, be comfortable. They want feeling, comfortable you know? that they are well cared for in all the aspects that are going to come down the line that you're not even aware of. Yeah, as we were not even aware of at the time until she was there. Um. Well, it's so, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. My dad was similar to your dad. He kind of hit a lot of the problems for my sister and I. He mm -hmm. facilitated mom getting to her nail appointments, her hair appointments, and all that stuff. She had friends that picked her up for um, a Seroptimus women's service group meetings. And one gal would drag my mom along on errands with her, which... My dad was never sure what time the lady would drop her off, so that always frustrated him. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was really nice of her to take my mom for, like, the majority right. of the day. I think he missed that part. But what a lot of people don't know is that 65% of caregivers will be hospitalized or die before their carry passes away. Mm -hmm. And my dad never discussed, never thought about... Um, a community, a memory community for my mom at all. I right. found out while he was on hospice that he just assumed she'd move in with me, which as I've said on prior episodes was a really bold assumption right. because my daughter did not move out until my, a month before my dad died. So I didn't even have a spare room. Wow. And, and my husband and I are both self-employed. I work from home. I'm also a professional photographer and my mom needed and still does obviously needs, you know, constant supervision, but she right. needs stimulation. And my sister and I went through a, a variety of thought processes on what to do with her. Cause living with my sister or with me was not an option. Right. right. And, I mean, I just turned 50 when my dad had passed away. So it was like, I'm sorry if it sounds terrible, but I wasn't ready to just quit working, which I can't afford to do. Or give up on all of, you know, going to the gym. I'm in a bicycling group and we go out twice a week. You know, I wouldn't be able to do any of that. So I wasn't ready to pretty much give up my social life to stay home with my mom because that's, no, that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> right, right. So the first place I looked at, there's a memory community, you know, assisted living memory community down literally a mile from here. Um, and I just wasn't impressed. And there are two board and care homes in my neighborhood, which I thought, because my mom is physically fine. It's just her brain is no good. And, but she had her dog with her. And I thought, you know, I don't think a board and care home is going to take her dog. And I was moderately concerned about her walking away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was hard. You know, you don't know about those things. So I, going through a place for mom also, went to another assisted living memory community that's not very far from here. It's the next town over. It's 
literally like 15 minutes from my house. And, you know, the place was, I thought it was beautiful then, and they've just gone through a renovation that they started in June, which, okay, it's even more pretty now, but, you know, it's like mm -hmm. renovating a memory care union is not fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it did my mom any favors. You know, she seems to have slipped a little bit in the last couple of months. It's really hard to tell, but her repeated questions happen more frequently. Mm -hmm. But this place let her keep her dog oh. until they did the renovations. And they really didn't want to ask me to rehome the dog, but we'd worked together, the executive director, <laughs> the med techs, the caregivers, to feed the dog properly, to get her in and out of the they have a beautiful courtyard the um residents the memory care residents surrounds this really nice fairly large courtyard so it's it's you know it's a really nice place um but the dog didn't have a lot of structure or a lot of discipline so she wasn't super obedient and the ladies the residents fed her from the table so this black miniature poodle who should have weighed 15 or 16 pounds weighed 27 wow and was and kept getting heavier it got mm -hmm. to the point i knew we were going to be rehoming her and they called one day and they said oh misty's limping and i'm thinking uh-huh i'd limp too if i was double my body weight right you know so <laughs> i'm like we'd gone through all kinds of testing with the vet to see if she was diabetic or other diseases and no it was just pretty much eating people food constantly she did not really eat dog food at all so she's better off where she's at now, hopefully getting slender and, and living out the rest of her life. She just turned 10, so she's not a young dog. Mm -hmm. Hopefully her senior years are going to be good. But oh, that was, good. you know, the, the, the way it looked and the fact that they had to keep her dog, let her keep her dog, those were the two biggest factors in why we chose where we did. And the, the other reason I liked the memory community versus a board and care home was the activities because I mm. thought well you know my mom was also creative she she was she did sewing she did painting even in later in life she did woodworking mm. but I thought okay well they've got activities tailored to people with memory issues well she doesn't do any of those which is frustrating <laughs> but there are my mom's name is Diane and there are two other Dianes <clears throat> in the residence and the three of them are like the three musketeers Oh, days. that's good. <laughs> it's more confusing because I'll ask my mom, well, where's your friend Diane? And she's like, I'm Diane. I'm like, yes, I know. The other Diane. And now, <laughs> the other, other Diane. <laughs> it's oh. you know, so she socializes and she, because she's physically fine, she helps other residents that are in wheelchairs or, you know, she's always helping and it gives her a, a purpose which right. right is definitely a good thing because we all need a purpose in life even if we can't remember what we did two minutes ago so right uh, and my mom never did that they they definitely had her sectioned off because she was advanced more uh, i think six months into her residency there they moved her to the second level which was more advanced dementia and dementia care but when she first got there she cared for a baby doll oh, yeah and she had found in the activity room this little baby that she carried around um, everywhere mm. I've got pictures of her with her holding her on her shoulder and taking her to bed and my dad finally went out and got her her own baby doll because that doll was obviously a therapy doll yeah. <laughs> in their activity room and she carried that around for about three months until she forgot about her baby yeah and and then um she just got steadily worse i mean that, that's all you can say is every time you'd go to visit her she she had a busy pad that they would put her at her table um and she she would pound the table with her hand and i or her legs you know and it was a very rhythmic thing that she did all the time and that bothered other residents so they got this pad for her where there were buttons and zippers and things that she could fidget with i think they do call it like a fidget pad or mm. something and that way it spread across the table so if she pounded on the table it didn't bother the other residents but um 
the last Christmas she was there, she loved to dance. So she was listening to Christmas music and dancing. We went and visited her. And that's one of the last pictures I have with her is dancing at Christmas time and, and a party that they did have <clears throat> with her before she started getting um, to the point where she didn't remember anything. Um, yeah. it, it was just, it was tough to see the decline happen so rapidly once it hit a certain point. And my dad would go, I mean, he was in very involved with the staff there. He would make DVDs of old movies for all the residents because they, um, and, and since he had done that, they would have movie nights or movie afternoons where every resident would come into that activity room and watch movies because they were movies from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, that they remembered. That, that's how I want my, like when I get placed in a home when I'm older, like just make every afternoon an, a movie afternoon. Right. Like, and mom loved it. She would listen from the back of the room, but sometimes she would get um, combative or agitated. And so they definitely needed to keep her separate, even at at meal times, she had her own section of a table that she sat at. Um, yeah, she she became more, more and more aggressive. Yeah, um, and it and, and it, frustrated with the like that she couldn't like piece together her surroundings, right? And all so she would jump to to anger and and be really aggressive. So unfortunately, she wasn't know. too social. She did have one gentleman that was her next door neighbor that he always told her, and her home that husband. he. Her home husband, yeah. Um, dad's what dad called her, uh, called him, is that, that that's her boyfriend, you her know, boyfriend. there. Um, but it was cute. And, and he would always um, come over to her and say, I really like your smile. Mm -hmm. Aww, Which would brighten her up. And that, I mean, it gave, you know, it gave a connection there. Um, and they ended up going to the upper floor I think together and living like a couple doors down from each other, but he, his family was always there visiting as well. And I think they were declining in the same, um, about the same rate. So I think they were a couple of the, the two that went up to that floor first, but yeah, it, um, it was definitely an eye opener. Um, and one that I knew was happening, but not, really grasping how quickly it was happening. Oh yeah. There's a certain sense of uh, personal denial that you go through. Yeah. Um, and not to, I mean, even going to the, you know, where like the first signs of the dementia, the, <clears throat> the repeated questions and whatnot, we all kind of played it off because we all had this like denial. Like, Oh, it's just grandma. Grandma's fine. Like, yeah, she's getting older. It's fine. And we, you know, you don't, like immediately connect all those dots, you know, and especially with, you know, grandpa kind of putting up those walls and only letting, you know, um, her socialize when she was having good days and coming to family events and stuff when she was ready to, to go, you know, like that, <clears throat> that keeps you in, in the sort of like dark personally as, as well. Um, I, I think part of that too is, you know, not, not wanting to realize that like you're losing, not, not, I don't know how to, how to, how to describe this. Like that you're, you're like a person that you've known that's been such a strong figure in your life is slipping away. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you, you, there's a block in your own, your own head, especially like for, for us on the grandkid level too. Like, Oh yeah, grandma's getting older, but like I don't know, we'll see her, you know, in Easter, and we'll see her, and we'll go over there, you know, a few Sundays and have dinner with them. It'll be fine, and then and then when she doesn't remember you, that's when it hits you. Yeah, but even then, like it, it takes it took a few times for me personally. Like mm -hmm. it took a few times where like um, I had to stop myself from going, yeah, you just asked this, grandma. Like realizing, like oh wait, 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 there is something going on here, and I I'm not helping anything by making her frustrated by thinking that she's already had this conversation three times with me, you know? Yeah. Right? And that's a really dangerous question to ask. And it's really hard not to, or, you know, statement, you know, yeah. you, already, you already said that I actually did pull that with my mom this past week. Um, she doesn't remember my dad died. She doesn't mm -hmm. remember the dog is gone. It's very, but she remembers the sweater that I confiscated. <laughs> she was literally, I mean, like that just blows my mind. And I'm the kind of person, 
I like to know why. I like to understand, you know, like, why does she forget my dad, who she was married to for 55 years? They met when she was, I believe, a sophomore in high school. So, you know, they knew each other like close to 60 years or they're about 60 years, but she doesn't realize that he's gone and she doesn't remember the dogs, but she remembers this sweater. It's like, I don't get it. Just like that kills me. <laughs> but when we, I, I like to take her out a lot of it because I just can't deal with answering the same questions over and over and taking her out gives some stimulation. Sure. That, um, you know, so I don't get the same question over and over. But also because they've been renovating, it's like, you know, it wasn't comfortable to sit like the living room was torn up and the dining room was torn up. It was like, you know, I'd have right. to sit in her room and it's like, yeah, I don't want to do that. So we go out. There's a regional park, two of them actually close by. And this past week I took her out like I do. We were halfway between her room and the doorway. And she's like, does my husband know where I'm at? Yes, mom. I told dad get to the doorway. So it's, we're talking like 15 feet. Does my husband know where we're? Yes, mom. I told that we get to the other outside door, you know, another 10, 12 feet. Same question. We get in the car. I'm like, Oh my God, this is like the fourth time in two minutes. And I'm like, you already asked me that, which I knew was bad and it didn't upset her. It just, it, it seemed fortunately that this particular week to end that questioning. Mm -hmm. My dad would get very frustrated with her, which is understandable, but his patience, mostly because his health was not good, what his patience was not good either. And so it bothers me that she asked that question so frequently because I know behind the question, and she'll even tell you, well, if my husband doesn't know where I'm at, he's going to get really upset. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I don't really need a reminder that he probably wasn't as patient as she needed and trust me it's not easy and like i said he had diabetes and he had all kinds of his own personal issues and he really should have looked into help you know now that i look back on it it would have served both of them quite well it would have been great if they would have considered moving into assisted living together right, right. he wouldn't have to worry about cooking for which he was terrible at <laughs> um, his eating habits were terrible too he was just total meat and potatoes guy and you know, just, I think a lot of the daily frustrations would have been partially alleviated if he had considered right assisted living. And there is, I believe, they're still there. There's a couple that lives in the memory residence. She needs memory care. He does not. And they'll he'll take her over to the other side to the assisted living. Um, he's in a wheelchair, so he's definitely not. You know, he's not raring to go but his mind is fine. So they're together and sh they're both being cared for in the manner they need to be cared for. And I'm sure it's giving them a little bit more life, a little more time together. And I wish more people would consider that because it's not, you know, when we put, first put my mom in the memory residence, it, it was difficult because I knew it wasn't what my dad wanted. And we literally was two weeks after he passed away. So a lot of emotions. My mom, mm -hmm. Well, that was the worst day of our life. Cried, begged, pleaded. It was horrible. But I knew it was the right thing to do oh. for everybody. My sister has school age kids. My daughter's almost 27. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, you know, you need a place that's going to take care of you. Not, not my house where I have to try to deal with you with all the other things. And I just, I knew it would be the right thing to do. And I wish he had checked into that more. And I think it would have helped both of them. Right. Okay. Our, our experience with getting mom to the, it, it affected us more than it affected her because she was at a level where she literally did not under, or not remember anything two minutes after it happened. Yeah. So she trusted my dad. We put her in the car. We got her to Crescendo. We walked in. Everybody was waiting there for her. And that, that was when she was very, um, like ha happy, happy, happy all the yeah. time, you know, say, you know, everybody well, was well, gra grandma. <clears throat> she, she had this, um, sort of like a, a, kind, a kindness air to her. No, no, no. Like uh, the pleasantries. Right. Yeah. So she would default into, um, sort of a, a stranger situation when she was with somebody that she trusted, uh, as 
though all of these people are very, very kind people and that they, they should be greeted with, uh, oh, hello, how are you? Right. So nice to see you again. Shaking hands, you know, all that kind of stuff became sort of this default. And we would see that um, at family functions as well before she went into um, the, the crescendo. Um, that when she would come to family functions, she was good at sort of putting on this sort of air of pleasantry uh, uh, about her so that when she greeted you, she would give you, you know, sort of the hug and, um, oh, how are you? So nice to see you again. When you would notify her, like the greeting sort of became this sort of pre-programmed thing where it was like, hello, grandma. I, you know, I'm so happy to see you to sort of re reinforce our roles to each other, mm -hmm. you know, in that split second. And then she would immediately sort of like relax and, you know, take remember your hand. Remember where she was, yeah. Well, and I don't even know if she remember where she was, but she was putting on that like, well, that she that could face. be comfortable Yeah, with she was you like, because... oh, you're my grandchild. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? It's so nice to see you again. And then right. would, you know, we would kind of go through the thing a couple times throughout those visits. But I, I think the same thing at Christina. She was in a good mood and she was with people she trusted, <laughs> and trusted. And they were receptive and positive to her. So I think that's what really helped. And so our transition was very easy. She walked in. The activity director came over and said, Donna, we are so happy to have you here and we've got a seat right here. You're just in time for lunch. She took her hand. Oh, how nice. She walked yeah. her into the dining room. She turned around to us and blew kisses <laughs> at us and the, the activity director waved us away and said, now's your time. We, now here's the transition. Run. And they put her <laughs> no. in there. She never <laughs> cried. She never said another word she just accepted that that was where she was to be we on the other hand walked out and cried our eyes out in the parking lot just turned to puddles <laughs> that that transition was a little bit tough but we knew that we were doing the right thing um and my dad you could see the relief in him physically um that he we had made the right decision and that that she transitioned so smoothly made it just that much easier that and um would have been nice uh, we yeah. what we did is we moved all of my mom's stuff into her room we put up all the family photos that she had had down the hallway to the bedrooms in their house and we we pretty much tried to recreate her space right um and then the son-in-laws my husband and my brother-in-law um brought mom over i think my mom had been with my husband and the caregiver that day i'm not really sure where my brother in law was <laughs> they came together with mom and we showed her her room and it was terrible and she missed dinner with the rest of the people so i could see how you're the way you guys handled it was definitely better so i think that's that's a good thing for people to know because you know we did it the way we we're kind of told and it was, like I said, it was pretty traumatic. Right. And it's not that there weren't people there. <laughs> I remember going to visit mom and there was a bench at the front door and there were always two ladies there sitting with their purses on their lap, ready to bolt. <laughs> oh, so when we would come in, we would know that we would have to say, okay, <laughs> you block Carol so that she doesn't start running for the door. <laughs> and because the gal sit next to her, will go with her. And then she would, you know, we, we understood um, that she was not happy being there and that she would tell you again and again and again. And it's just different levels of the, the process. Um, and we felt very grateful that at the time mom went in, she was, it was, it was her, the right time to actually not traumatize the situation, you know, for her being fearful. And well, that was a big she, concern. She so. was also at a, a sort of place in her dimension a bear, uh, the next that, yes that we there wasn't going to be a lot of that like held on to resentment and, if we had and done it six months prior or two years prior yeah. we probably would have had oh, a yeah. big fight on our hands so it was just um when my dad finally could not do it anymore was that time you know it just seemed an easier transition yeah when he let his his sort of stubborn pride go of being sort a little of like, bit, yeah. He wanted. I'm the to husband. Fix it. I need to be the one that is. I made a vow, you know. Like, right. there's there's some chivalry there, uh, but well, and it, it's, it's beyond your scope your a little bit. Tell sometimes, you, Dad, you you're doing it. You did it. Yeah. Till you know, literally, death do you part. You did an excellent job. He did. 
He shielded his kids. The grand, you know, grandkids and the too. grandkids as best he could. But when we had to get involved, we stepped up and we helped him get through those parts that he couldn't get through. Um, so he, he kept his promise. And I think he's finally at peace with that. Mm. That's good. Now, yeah. I want to ask a quick question. You said mom was really organized. Yes. Did you notice? Because one of the early signs of Alzheimer's or memory loss, and you said they diagnosed her with vascular dementia, so this may not apply because that's mm -hmm. different. Um, but one of the early signs is the inability to, like, make a plan and follow it through, like follow a, a recipe you've used all these times or – you know, okay, we're going to have family Sunday dinner and this person's bringing this and that person's bringing that and I'm going to do this, you know, those kind of details. Did you notice she having struggles with that? You know, they had stopped doing that kind of stuff a long time ago. Um, we took over family gatherings, so we would just tell them, you know, just show what up. you need to bring and this yeah. is where we're doing it, you know, that kind of stuff. So a, a lot like around the time that they were um, retiring. Well, even before, before that, they, yeah. my brother and I, you know, those families we took on every other holiday, you know, so they just didn't have to worry about it anymore. Um, but, you know, in her pre years, she did genealogy. She did, um, oh, she yeah. organized, I mean, as I'm going through her craft room and, and, purchase thing or not purchase but the, my dad gave me things the needle point the, the, the organization the, yeah. of the thread everything was marked and her genealogy books that were to the nth degree of detail um, and it even surprised my dad when he was going through some of the things in there thinking I had no idea that your mom was this meticulous meticulous yeah. she would just do her thing and that's what she enjoyed. And she was an excellent um, administration, administrative person in her working life, too. She was, like, uh, yeah, good, very <laughs> good at what she did. Um, and everything in her house is organized. Um, everything that they did to organize their house, she had a hand in it. My dad is very talented in that respect of building things and and so they would work together to do those things. And so every nook and cranny in their house has a little hidden thing that's functional that had my mom's input as well as my dad's input in there. So, yeah, she, but, but towards her <laughs> dementia, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that question because she didn't do those sort of things um, to be able to gauge it. Yeah, that's funny. Like, I never really noticed... Um the the over attention to detail but now that you've mentioned it like the kids closet yes at grandma's house that had all of our like where we would just go to get crayons and coloring books and whatnot like very specifically organized coloring books crayon boxes activity sets games. and games yes and a specific space <laughs> underneath <laughs> the stairs that little people could get into yeah to find those things yeah, that's, uh, yeah exactly yeah. I, it, now that i'm like remembering <laughs> this room vividly she, from my childhood like yes. the playing cards the board games the coloring books and then these sort of like three vhs tapes that we would watch when we go over to grandma's house that, that's movies she very well had, uh, baskets series. and and Christmas gifts and all that kind of stuff yeah. was very well planned That's out. Funny. So oh, I, I hadn't was, paid much attention to that. My mom was not that organized. I mean, she wasn't careless about stuff, but she just wasn't not that many people are that meticulous. I'm pretty meticulous and that's, that's even maybe a step above me. But I think <laughs> you said they stopped doing some of the things like hosting the family dinners and when you look back, you could probably say, well, you know what? She was probably starting to have memory issues then because it, you know, becomes a challenge to, to plan out even simple things. And one of the best examples I've, I've read recently is a lot of times people who are starting in the early stages of memory loss, you know, they, they stop eating properly. And, you, and a lot of us are like, well, why can't they just make a freaking sandwich for themselves? Well, if you stop and think about all the steps involved in making a sandwich, right. you've got to get out the bread and the meat and the cheese and the condiments, and you've got to put it all together in a nice way. You gotta, I mean, there's a lot of steps just to a basic sandwich. And mm -hmm. it, 
your b brain is not processing, you know, step one, two, three, four in, in the proper order, making a sandwich is a challenge. Right. And I, I never thought about it until somebody was, there was, um, we were talking about why, you know, how to pay attention to their nutrition. They were, you know, they were talking about warning signs of possible memory loss, possible struggles that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily notice until somebody said, Hey, I think that's a warning sign. And you're like, yeah, okay. I mm -hmm. think you're right. So she we're probably, dealing, we're dealing with that with my mom's youngest sister. I was just, that's the first uh, thing that shut up. To we, my mind we have this issue running through the sisters. The older sister is in um, her daughter's care in Colorado. Mm -hmm. She's in a facility and is having memory issues. Um, and then my mom, who was more advanced than both of her sisters, but they're all in different stages of it. And then her younger sister, who's probably mid to late seventies, I believe um, is exhibiting the same memory loss issues. And my dad took on while mom was in, we got mom in a facility. So he didn't have the daily thing. He went to go check on her sister finding very familiar signs and getting her financial well-being in order um, to take care of that because without those durable power of attorneys of authority, we cannot take care of her. Right. He took it on in the middle of all of this to make sure that her bills were paid, that he had durable power of finance and health for her. And then for us, as the committee now has expanded to um, oh, yeah. other cousins uh, to see where we can now take care of Aunt Mary, um, who is in a very um, kind of a tender stage of this illness because she's aware, partially. Yeah. So That's when you try to ask her questions, she gets resentful. Why are you asking me that? But she can't work a microwave, doesn't remember how. Um, we're not even sure that she's showering herself on a regular basis. And my dad goes out there once a week and he makes, she picks up mail, picks up whatever's coming, checks on her, takes her out of the house. But he's concerned that she takes walks every day now and that this is not going to get any better and that we need to do something. And so we're in the throes of that. Trying to get her to, Trying stop, to get, stop getting delivery from... Uh, pizza, pizza Hut. Yeah. yeah, she calls Pizza Hut and they deliver food. She remembers enough about yeah. how to get pizza delivered. But she can't make any. I don't know if she makes her tea anymore. Yeah. Um, she can't. My dad tried to get her to do the microwave and she just didn't remember. Uh, she was at my mom's memorial and she followed me around. Um, yeah. Couldn't remember my name. Was very concerned that she could not remember anybody's names there, which was a lot of family. Um, and I told her, you just stay right by me. You need someone's name. I'll give you their name and we'll reintroduce you. And so she did follow me around for a while. And at, at Mom's Memorial, we had a, a display of her seasons of life. And one of the seasons was when she was born, which had a lot of pictures of my mom as a baby and Aunt Mary and her sister and mother and father. And that's the table that Mary went to and would tell people, that's my sister Donna. That's my sister, Zoe, mm. and that's me. There's my brother. There's my mom and dad, and I thought, hover at that table, Mary, and remember, Yeah, that's your family, mm. but she didn't remember anything past that on the memories of my mom and even pictures of her older, so it was quite an eye-opener for the extended committee <laughs> to say, uh-oh, here we go again in the throes of all of this. This is a challenging year, a couple years, and, and it's not over because we're still trying to um, assist Aunt Mary, and it's not going to be easy. We are going to have a fight because we're, we're trying to look for where she can afford with what she's got, and it looks as though we may need to take her out of state, so that might not be a journey that's going to be easy. So, No, there, trying to convince her. Yeah. Is there a community near the... The person who's in Colorado? 
Um, actually, they're looking for another cousin that's living in Nevada, who ha is her is one of the durable or one of the people and that sort of, for so, her care. Yeah, the closest to a sort of son to her. She didn't have right. any kids of her own. Right. Um, but and has a very very close bond to um, you know your cousin. Right. So the, he's involved with. Um, my cousin in Colorado. My cousin in Colorado cannot do this because she's taking care of her mom. Her mother, yeah. um, so we are we are in discussions about that, and both of the, them are talking to because my cousin in Colorado has done a lot of research on the financial aspect. Is the same for both, both in multiple states. So like she's she's yeah. Got they have to <laughs> dig dig into uh, finances differently than my dad had to for my mom. We're so. going to have to start like a, like a family trust that encompasses the entire extended family <laughs> so that we can like have governance board meetings to decide like how <laughs> we're going right. to financially handle our generations as we go older. Well, and, and it's different too, just simply because we went through it and, and Dottie's been through it in Colorado with her mom by herself, just with her husband. Uh, her sister passed away years ago, so she doesn't have any sibling assistance there and then Dwayne who his daughters still aren't married yet you know yeah. they're still a young family and some, so one of them's still in college again. yeah so he's he's taking on something that is he's learning about um and and we're trying to help that you know as best we can if if it should be something that changes we have to go to plan b <laughs> but we all have to be involved because like Corey said, she does not, she did never married and never had children and considers us her babies. Yeah. Whether she remembers our names or not, we're there to help protect her, you know, and uh, my dad can only do so much. Yeah. Um, and I don't blame him for not wanting to take any more on than he's already taken on. So no, it's he, exhausting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He did his, he did his, his duty, um, and he's helping to transition in this to make sure that Mary is safe wherever she ends up. Well, that's awesome of him. And I like Corey's idea of the, like, the generational family trust governance. I don't right? even know if that's a thing you can do, but it's... It'll have Why not? To Why not? Like, I, we I just think have we've like done a, it in a way yeah, with the committee. We just keep adding people. You got, come in here, come in here, and we will help but, guide you where you need to go. We, we could also like set up in that respect, like what you would expect for your future if your your health were to, to true, start so that everybody's whatever, you know? aware of what's like everybody going in on. the family just sort of knows, like okay, these are the plans for our generational, you know, <laughs> like and we vote on stuff and we could. You know, yeah. Why? Why and, not? And the important we, we vote too. on where where to have Christmas. Why can't we vote on like where we want to you know sort of end up in our care facilities? Well, life? that's true. And and if you as you get through your life, like we are at our sp specific stages, you set up a trust and a will, and you make right. sure that those things are written, and um, makes it easy for the children to take on whatever needs to happen. And yes. I tell my dad all the time, you know, when you're 20 something, 30 something, you go, yeah, 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 dad, thanks for that thing. We did our will and trust. We did this, we did this. And you're not ready to hear that. Then you get older and you think, okay, I need to do this for you right. because I want that transition when that happens to be as seamless for you as possible. So we did that. My brother did that for his four kids. I did that for you, or we did that for you. And so it makes it easier um, to plan for that, you know, to have the long-term care uh, available to you so that you can make these decisions right. easier. Unfortunately for Dottie and for my Aunt Mary, they didn't do that. Right. And so we are learning as we go. It's not the same situation that it was for mom. Um, dad just told us, I, you know, money is no object at this point. So you just tell me where you feel like we, you know, you would feel comfortable putting mom. Right. And that's what we did. But it's very different. Um, so. Huh. Yeah, my parents had a trust. And the one thing that I, 
I didn't understand with my dad. I mean, he planned so much and did really well, like you guys are talking about, but he didn't, it wasn't super clear in the trust what, whose roles were what if he were to pass first. Oh. Um, it was in there, but we actually, my sister and I had to go to an attorney who had to read through it. It was on page one of his part of the trust that if he passed first, my mom obviously was the beneficiary and the trustee and all that stuff, but she was not legally competent. Right. And it was on like page 11 where it said my sister and I were the successor trustees if my mom was unable to handle everything. And I mean, we thought we were literally terrified that we were going to have to ha go to court and have her declared legally incompetent. And fortunately this lawyer found where it was in the trust, you know, but it was like, but they didn't talk, you know, mine, I knew my mom did not, she didn't want to end up like her mom. Well, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I knew a long time ago that wasn't going to be the case. And they just had this, I don't think they ever actually went to a for-profit assisted living memory care community and looked at it. Well, no, my dad had been at one. We went together for the business we had together. So I don't know. I don't, I don't understand why it was never discussed you know, what, what we would do with mom. It was just assumed she'd come live with me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm sure with lots of conversation with you at that point. <laughs> no conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like zero. Yeah. I found out from his friend who was originally the executor of their trust. Um, thankfully, he backed out of that. And yeah, he just looked at me and he goes, well, you know, your dad just assumed your mom's going to live with you. And I'm like, nope, no, that's not, not going to happen. At that, at that point, my daughter still lived at home. So I don't know where they thought I was going to put my mom. Well, and in his state of mind of caregiving, I can see where you, you kind of shut down. You, you just make it so in your head and just hope that everybody takes care of it. Yeah. And I think that's at, at a certain point, that's where my dad got where he just, I cannot make this decision. I need your help. And that was where we stepped in. And it was literally to, to find the place to put mom, knowing that once she was there, this life was going to change as he knew it. Mm -hmm. And we knew it, but mostly for him. For 24-7, he was taking care of every need that she ever had. And he finally admitted he couldn't do it anymore. And no judgment. I don't know, well, you know, how people only... deal with that. It is just, you, you gotta go to the next step. You try to put that in perspective too. Like it's a life that he's been familiar with accustomed to for 60 years. Well, they would have celebrated their 62nd. Yeah. 62 um, years anniversary together. On so September like, 28th. Yeah. To, to be, to know that like once this happens, this is a complete 180 on, on your life. His, you know? his purpose, mm -hmm. daily purpose was changing. And really at that time, he did not know. He was, um, there was depression. He was, uh, how am I going to deal with this? It's going to be quiet. How am I going to deal with this? Mm -hmm. And it's like one step at a time, dad. But it's a, it was a total um, fear. Uh, you know, of, of how, how is this going to be once this is done? And so it took a while for him to cross that line to actually say, I have no choice. I have to do this. He held on to it as long as he could. Um, and then when the committee came in, he realized that that help was there. You know, we'll, we'll help you get through that part too. Well, um, and then he could sort of begin the, the process of like letting go of grandma right even while she was still alive i mean that sounds old i guess to 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 the to like an outside point of view but like really grandma left well before she she actually passed you right. know um and that process of being able to you know take a deep breath and not have to um be her primary ca caregiver for my grandfather allowed him to start the process of sort of grieving his wife 
grieving you know? his wife and living, taking yeah. care of himself right. as well, because he could not do by his choice, um, do a lot of things he should have been doing. Well, yeah, he sacrificed his entire Un- life at that it, point to make sure that she was comfortable. Exactly. Until yeah. like the, the couple months before when we had the caregiver that came in house and then he would leave to go do things where he didn't have to take mom with him. Even and mom store, was comfortable, you know? like staying with the caregiver, but she would get panicky if she didn't see my dad. So he would take her everywhere. So it took three times as long to do something because she would wander, <laughs> lose her, you know, all of those things that honestly, I, I can only hear what he's saying. I never experienced those things because he never, he never pulled us into that. It's all very tight. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like what my dad did. Mm -hmm. And I've taken my mom out, you know, to buy stuff she needs, toilet paper, all the usual basics. And I always get a little bit nervous. She absolutely loves kids. I mean, she's a mom, she's a grandma, loves children. And sometimes she approaches moms with babies in strollers and Mm -hmm. she never touches them. Not yet, but I'm always afraid, you know, that it's, you know, how people can be a little weird. Some people don't want normal people approaching their kids. Exactly. And, you know, I think it's obvious that my mom is not all there. So I would hope that, you know, if I don't catch it before, you know, she sees, she seems to spot the moms with strollers way before I do. Right. <laughs> um, like one day I, I turned, I had turned my back to pick something up off the shelf and I turned back and she's standing there with her hands, you know, up against her chest and she's talking to this mom with this baby in the stroller. And I was just like, Oh, please, oh. please, please be kind. She just, you know, and it's like, and please don't try to touch the baby. I was just, I almost went into panic mode. Oh, I and, understand. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, I have taken her to our local city park. We have a splash zone back, oh. you know, when it was still hot. I took her out, her and her other friend, Diane, out there, and they watched the kids, and they loved that. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to find activities where th- they can watch the kids. Well, that sometimes feels a little creepy. <laughs> right. Uh, in context, <laughs> right? Well, like- <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. But um, I, I, we never were able to take mom out of the facility. She... Um, well, my she, dad she did hard to get her in a car. Yeah, even, it know. was she she was fearful of everything towards the end more so than she ever she always was fearful but it just was more she, um, she was quite a tentative woman. You know, yes. yes. Um but she got a lot of visits um and they would bring the babies in and of course the grandkids were the biggest hit of everyone there. You know, you'd yeah. bring a baby in and all of the grandmas would become grandmas. <laughs> Oh, yeah. sure. Again, you know, and so We'd Corey's, have to do the tour, wife, Corey's right? wife would take the boys yeah. out and, and just talk to all the residents and they would like, oh, baby. And, and you do the tour of the courtyard and did everybody kind of gets a yard in the activity room and the <laughs> dining room. So, and, and trying, cause Jackson's a little bit older than army. And um, so Jackson was, had questions, you know, yeah. he didn't understand why great grandma was not, recognizing him and and so it was a, a lesson would, like, for them out, yeah you know yeah so um it she was it was quite for yeah. a, a few minutes yeah but babies seemed to be the key that uh, it brought it was so um joyful i i every time the babies were there to see the light come on everybody's face uh, the moms mostly, not the the men that were there, but it was mostly yeah. for the the women that were there. Well, I think it, it's kind of a, a beautiful example of this sort of human condition, right? Right. Like that <clears throat> when you see, like as as a somebody who has lived a full life, somebody who has you know raised children of their own, or you know helped in the sort of communal raising of children, um, or having had grandbabies or, or whatever. When you see new life mm-hmm. at that old older age, <clears throat> how much it just brings a light back to you right as a person you know like that's that's kind of this beautiful little example like i said like of of like humanity Mm -hmm. in a weird way that like you know a baby comes around and you're just like oh a baby Mm -hmm. look at how adorable like oh you have so much potential ahead of you that's right and you know like to to see that especially in in these care homes and I'm, i'm sure that's why grandma gravitated towards 
the baby dolls. The baby doll. Yeah. You know, yeah, she would just always carry it, carry it around, and and the the padding went from like banging on a table to sort of like padding the back. padding the back of the baby, yeah. or or the sort of you know like the butt of the baby to sort of like rock it to sleep or whatever. Yeah. Um. And I yeah I, I don't know it's it's interesting. I wonder if there is like a study that talks about the connection between like babies and and elderly people. I I think there's a part of their brain that remembers way way back and that joy. I I don't know. Yeah. I think there's a part of them that's in there mm-hmm. as they, as they decline Just banging on the doors and, and as, as daughters and grandchildren and, you know, we are trying to spark something in that part of their memory where that you can see in their eyes, you can see it. And yeah. it's like, I know you're there. I know you're there. And just acknowledge that uh, yeah. for them. If that's all you can do is just acknowledge that that spark is still there. I think it might also be, it's such a basic core of our biology to care mm-hmm. for these small little humans with all this potential. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, like my mom raised two daughters and she's got three grandkids and she was, because my daughter is 14 years older than my niece, my sister and I are only five years apart. So um, I started early. My sister started a little later. Uh-huh. Uh, my mom was a huge part of my daughter's early childhood, you know, mm-hmm. until they get to that snotty teenage years. Even <laughs> then, they were still close, but you know, it's not as fun to hang out with grandma when you're 13 or 14 years old. And then my niece was born when my daughter was 14, so she got a slightly replaced, you know, <laughs> in normal ways. Not like my mom stopped paying attention to her or anything. But I think it's almost like. Um, and I can't remember the word at the moment. It's like, it's like basic biology, you know, just, oh, I wish I could remember that word. I hate it when I can't remember words because it always <laughs> makes me freak out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it just goes to the core of our humanity. And I think that's why they perk up. And, you know, my mom always loves it when there's kids visiting. I go on Mondays, so I, I don't get to see that terribly often. Mm-hmm. When I, you know, there was... One day, this two-year-old was there, and he was the courtyard is in the middle, and so you could basically run this square O, and he was just literally running around screaming like two-year-olds do. And the first thing my mom did was kind of complain about the noise, which is typical for her. But then she realized that it was a kid, and she's like, "Oh, but it sounds like they're having a lot of fun." So it was very interesting to see her reaction to this little guy, and she talked to him and. You know, and it just, it was very different. It's, it's interesting. I'll have to look. I'm going to look for a study on the connection between people with memory loss and taking care of a baby. Because I know they actually have like very lifelike baby dolls for mm-hmm. people with memory loss. And I've seen like little videos where they give the, well, here's your baby. And they swaddle it in the pink or the blue mm-hmm. blankets. And and they That's handled what my to- mom had, yeah. Yeah. And the last thing that when she was at home, um, Corey had had his second son. He was only maybe three weeks old, four um, weeks old. He was pretty fresh squeezed, but uh, I'm he not sure. He was so tiny. And we took Army over to meet great grandma. And at this point, my mom would jibber jabber when she talked there was nothing that made sense you know she would go off on a conversation and we would just shake our heads and listen yeah well, she would join the conversation and she with a would few join words a and conversation and just like you know having this conversation and then they would get scrambled and yeah. nothing made sense we put army in her arms and i have this is the last videotape i have this was literally before we put her um, at crescendo she's holding him she's looking at him and she's having a conversation with him um you know hello sweetheart how are you i mean literally yeah a com a one-on-one conversation that made sense wow and she would look up and say he is just precious and then look back down yeah. at him and he's looking at her she's looking at him and i was in awe i i took the video and i went dad uh, you know she's actually having a conversation that makes sense and that was the last time i think that there was a that come out of her but it was while he laid in her lap and connected somehow it was intriguing to say the least yeah 
Yeah, yeah. that is really interesting. Mm -hmm. There is a, my mom's next door neighbor where she lives um, is Irish and, and she speaks mostly gibberish. Some of it sounds like it might be Irish. And then occasionally there's some words that pop out and she'll come up to you and literally almost touching you face to face and, and say something to you. And it's like, you just have to like listen really hard and pray for a word that makes sense so that you can maybe come up with something that she wants. Context so, clues yeah. of the situation. Yeah, to exactly. decipher the... So it's, it'd be interesting to see what would happen if she had one of those baby dolls. I'll have to mm -hmm. hmm, give me ideas. Yeah, <laughs> we'll Run see. your own experiment. The first yeah, really. one got a hold of, she gravitated towards that doll in the activity room. She was the one who sought it out and then kept it as her own. So my dad had to go get her one of her own because it was a therapy doll right. for others. Yeah. And so she did. And I'm not quite sure whatever happened to that doll, but dad said it just ended up back, I think, in the room. And I think mom has forgotten that she has a baby doll. She's at a different level now. But it yeah. helped her to sleep. She would sleep. She took it everywhere for the first, I think, three or four months that she was there. Yeah, yeah, she never put it down. And you would mm. ask her, where's your baby doll? And, of course, they would bring it um, to her because they, they, she'd pat it. And it was mostly so that she would not annoy the other. Because uh, they, you know, the other residents, when they're annoyed, they don't mind telling you. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> so, and it would make her feel bad. You know, they would yell or, you know, they would get aggressive because she was being noisy and you just, so, you know, the baby doll was mostly for that, but, um, whatever works, whatever works. They, right? lose, they seem to lose some of the social filters. There's a lady where my mom lives who is, well, she's in a wheelchair. I don't know if she is actually can walk a little bit. Um, and doing research on Alzheimer's, I understand where she's at. But she's always like, help, help, help me. Won't you help me? I need help. And it's like, oh, it's terrible. Right. And right. so I always say, what do you need, Betty? And she'll sometimes she'll answer and sometimes she'll, can you help me? And I'll be like, let me go get, you know, one of the staff. Um, she's more help. She needs more assistance than I'm comfortable giving. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just kind of her go-to verbalization. Help me. And it's like monotone. It's not like she's panicking. It's just right. like, help me, help me. I need help. <laughs> it's like, no, okay. it, it's interesting to, to, to see like, I, like I mean, it makes me curious of like what, what, what those, like what she was like as a younger person, you know, is, is she somebody who would have like, you know, sent food constantly back at a restaurant? <laughs> Well, or like, you know, or is like somebody it, who always wants to see a manager. And so that's the way it gets like that sort of personality gets sort of manifested in, in like, they're reverting, just asking for help. Right. They're reverting but because to what she's they're monotone, familiar like, with in their brain. That's, that's, that's popping at the time, yeah. whatever they can grab. I'm sure. That's fascinating to me. And um, she's always like that. So yeah, I'm, I'm, next time she hollers at me like that, I'll have to, I'll have to kind of contemplate on that. Um, <laughs> trying to think. See, the three Dianes are all pretty conversational. My mom is the least of the three. Her, the, the one friend, Diane S., still reads. Oh, and, that's, that's um, good. I don't know if you heard the episode on the two lap books. They're fantastic. They're um, beautifully illustrated books with one phrase per page. Like, I love to feel the sunshine on my face. And then it's, it's basically like an 11 by 14 or 14 by 11 book. So the pages, the pictures are huge. And obviously, you know, it'll be a older woman sitting in a chair with the sunshine on her face and flowers. And they're just fantastic. Well, in the very beginning of this book is like the directions on how to use it and, and talking points. I mean, it's that part is for the caregivers and her friend read that part. And you no, know. <laughs> and she can still read. She still yeah, recognizes was, words. She was always, she's always carrying around a novel and always, you know, reading. And I never, never knew, is she actually just reading or just going through the motions or, you know, cause like sometimes, you know, if you're tired, you're like, I've read the same page three times. So I kind of wondered if she was at that point, but no, she actually does read. And then the other Diane 
by looking at her, you would not realize that she has memory issues. She looks like she might be visiting. She's always very well dressed. Her hair is always nice. You know, I don't know if she wears a lot of makeup, but she, she always looks really well put together. And so that's, that's the three of them. So they're all different. But she was really surprised Monday when I brought mom back. Um, I had them all out in the courtyard having jello. And I said something about the three Dianes. And she was shocked that I knew her name. And it was like, uh, okay. <laughs> My memory is not bad yet. Aww. It's just really interesting because they're all different. But some of them do get, um, you know, not they get a little hostile. And a lot of it's fear. And, exactly. You know, My mom did the same thing. She did the same thing. And a lot of other people there had their own triggers that would, um, I mean, we were sitting in there one time and they called bingo a bingo game. And so they all came down and the caregiver was late for bingo and they all got really bad. Oh, yeah, don't be late <laughs> oh, for bingo. Oh my goodness. And I sat there and I said, you know, she'll be here in just a minute. Well, she was supposed to, I go, well, she's going to go get the bingo balls. Why do we even have activity schedules if That's we're not going exactly to keep them? exactly what the bingo master, <laughs> a gentleman who, who they were waiting for him to get there, um, he's here and we need to start the bingo now. <laughs> It oh, was funny. Got you know, five dollars on this game. Let's things. go. But the you know, I caregivers, <laughs> honestly, um, they are the best. Uh, it just they could probably write novels on all the different things that they've dealt with and seen. Um, but for me, it was quite an interesting journey um, where you have to sit pretty much in the background and just let it happen mm -hmm. and you can't react. My dad was a, a big advocate for instructional um, educational things to give to the family to say, this is how you should be speaking to someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. You can't challenge them. Don't, don't say you've said that to me three mm -hmm. times. And I did a lot of shaking my head and really, really. And then that causes them to, go on to their next thought, whatever mm -hmm. it is, and keeps them comfortable. So yeah, there's this yeah. sort of a retraining that, that you need to go through. And a lot of people sort of just deal, like figure that out the hard way. Right. And They're your like, own frustrations um, have to go. Um, you have to deal with those in another place. Well, the first part of that though is, is, is acceptance too. Like you right? have to accept that, you know, your, your loved one, your, the strong mother figure, your, your, you know, the father figure or, you know, whatever has, has She's now no transitioned dead. into, um, you know, somebody who's, who's dealing with the world that is brand new to them every 20 minutes or it two is. days or, you know, whatever. And they're scared. And yeah, there's a fear to that mm -hmm. because the, all the power that they had or the perception that they have of self at that point is also in, in jeopardy, you know, like it's in conflict. And so, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're afraid that their world is completely different. They don't understand why because their brain isn't, isn't able to contextualize and, and that with know. a sort of memory of why they're, yeah. you know, dealing we with don't what know doing. what's firing and what's not. If they come into a realization where they go, ah, this isn't me. Yeah. And then it goes away, you know, so that's, it's got to be a, a huge struggle in their heads. Yeah. We just, we don't know. And you would never know unless God forbid you have to deal with it yourself. And then you, you can't know. explain it either. And you can't explain no. it. <laughs> yeah, no. my um, my mom is really agreeable, which mm -hmm. she was always a very strong and stubborn personality, and she still <laughs> is. And the whole one of the reasons I confiscated this particular sweater is because I wasn't seeing her in anything but, mm -hmm. and I suspected <laughs> that it wasn't getting laundered because she wasn't allowing them to. And I asked them, I said, is she giving you a hard time about changing clothes? And they said, oh, yeah. And she's, she's giving a hard time about showering. I'm like, oh, great. Okay, well, that explains the other problem that I was kind of thinking about. And they were trying very hard to insist that she get in the shower. But, you know, there's a very fine line between insisting and, and elder abuse. So, you know, they, they err on the side of caution more than than I would like, but I understand why they do. And it turned out that they had, they'd moved her shower to the afternoon, which my mom is not an evening shower person at all. And I said, no, 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 you need to switch that back. Everybody will be happier if you switch that back. And then the gal that's in charge of helping my mom with showers 
has learned that when she gets to work on mom's shower days, the first thing she does is go into mom's room and say, okay, we're going to shower. Because if my mom gets up and gets dressed, forget it. There will be no shower. She will not. And she told the caregiver at one point, she goes, you know, I am not a child. And she just got really angry with her. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. That was the first time I'd heard of her getting crossways with them. Right. And, that, you know, and this one gal, I hadn't seen her for a while. And I was terrified that she left because she's, she's so great. And she doesn't, you know, I, I work with them as much as I can. But one day, I guess in the spring, she came up to me and she's like, your mama needs new pants. I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I will get on that right away. Which, which pants are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> well, she had lost so much weight that everything she had was too big. Ah. And I had walked into her room after being informed that mom needed to go shopping. I walk in her room and she's pulling on some pants and they are literally at least three sizes too big. And I thought, Oh no, we are not having an old lady wardrobe malfunction. Right. No, no. Yeah, I'm gonna put you in all elastic, mom. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Leggings. Would yeah, do you'll well. just be yeah. in like yoga pants, <laughs> leggings. Well, see, here's the stretchy challenge. material. My mom, you know, so I took my mom shopping that time. We bought some capris because it was, you know, summer was coming. It was hot, and all she had was those those old lady polyester pants. Oh yeah. Well, my sister took her shopping probably nine months later for regular pants and my mom and her dad always were slender, but they have no butt or, you know, my grandfather had no butt. My mom's got no butt. So it can fit around the waist and the hips, but it's like, it's a saggy mess in the back and it's just, <laughs> just the way it is. Right. You know, and when you can only have elastic waist pants because you can't handle zippers and buttons anymore, you don't get a lot of options on, you know, there's not enough options to find the exact style that fits all over well. Well, my sister found a pair of beautiful gray slacks. They're, they're almost fuzzy. They're so soft. And they're um, skinny legs. So they, oh my gosh, they look so great. I think my mom's worn them once. Oh. We would rather wear these god-awful, ugly old lady pants oh, <laughs> because dear. they're familiar. Right. And every time, and this has been my challenge, and, you know, it's, Nobody's had a, a workaround for me, but you know, stuff is wearing out. She's been in the memory community like 18 months, and a lot of the stuff was old when we brought it over and it's wearing out. And it's like, mom's got money to buy a new comforter or buy some new pants. It's not like, you know, we're not going to Neiman Marcus for this stuff. So, you know, you go to Pennies or Target, and mom's got money for these things. And if she doesn't recognize it, which of course she doesn't, she gives it to her friend. Oh dear. So frustrating. Oh dear. You know, so a couple weeks ago I'd gone to my support group and we had the open forum and I swear like two thirds of us were all like, yes, our family member is not showering regularly and won't change their clothes. What do we do about this? And one gal said, well, you just need to limit the amount of clothes they had. And my first instinct was my mom had probably a 10 foot long closet, double hung, Plus the eight, maybe eight feet, seven feet closet in the guest room with clothes. Like now she's got this little like one door closet. You know, it's probably two and a half feet wide. So right. I'm like, what do you mean? she's got way less clothes. So when I went the following week and I looked, I opened her closet because I'm like, I got to kind of sort of keep track of what's going on with these clothes. And I looked in the closet. And I'm like, first off, I'm going to take out all the short sleeve shirts because it's, you know, end of October now. We don't really need short sleeve shirts. I must have taken out 16 items of clothing and it still looks pretty full. And I have not heard any complaints other than she doesn't remember where the sweater went. <laughs> oh, dear. Still fixated the on the sweater. sweater. That's it's weird. It's like, you don't remember your husband died in the sweater. I don't get it. I really don't get it. Uh, I wonder if there's uh, like with the pants situation too. Like, if, I wonder if it's more or less uh, like a like texture. Well, a, a, either a texture or a, a color association too. Um, like Could you we. go to, to one of the more like basic memory things. Right. You know, it, it's about like feel and and sort of like yeah, generic color. So like the gray slacks, she doesn't remember owning a pair of gray slacks. But if these pants are like a blue or a purple or something like that, if you got 
something that matched that same color if she would recognize that as being something that's more familiar? Maybe. You know? I might have to go try to find those. Important, yeah. Um, well, I know, I don't think she likes the skinny leg. I mean, they look fantastic on her. Right. Yeah. That's not something that she would have worn previous. So I'm wondering if that's the case. So maybe I'll go to Penny's or I don't even think Target sells the old lady clothes like that. Penny's does. Yeah, they have a whole <laughs> yeah. section Ooh, there. Throwing shade yes. on Penny's. Well, they do, though. They have a whole section there for the older woman. Um, my mm-hmm. grandmother used to shop there exclusively. Sears used to have one, and so did Penny's. I think it's uh, Alfred somebody. Uh, because Alfred Dunner. Yes, he would, he would go get mom's uh, clothes there, too, mm. because of the type of clothes it was. And she was so tiny. You know, they make those tiny, petite, tiny petite little sizes. Um, but, you know, my husband's mom, she is in a facility. She's physically uh, challenged, but her mind is still there. But when we go it's visit her, complete 180 a of, complete 180 of, of care. Yeah. But it is extremely important to her to have her outfits color coordinated oh, yeah. in her closet. So we spend a good portion of time when we're there making sure that the, the pants match the tops because sometimes the caregivers don't do that for well, she, her. She is, uh, uh, but she's, she's a performer. Yeah. Oh, neat. So, yeah. you know, she has to be in like. But color is, is big time. She was yeah. painted and did all that stuff. And yeah, she's, she was an artist too. And, and uh, does she still paint while she's there? Uh, well, I, I don't think she has there. The, it's familiar. The she sort of can't see very well to do more. that. But yeah. Yeah, but she, so she would always show up in matching purple things and a giant red <laughs> jumpsuit and, you know, like she was always quite colorful, personality-wise and uh, clothes-wise. Yeah, yeah, the Absolutely. garland in her hair for, for Christmas, you know. Dressing the, up as Lady Liberty for 4th of July. Yeah, that kind That's of cool. buoyancy. Yeah. So, you know, if they were strong in that in, in their life, that may be something that's, that is still that spark in them, that the colors are important, texture was yeah. huge important with my mother. If it, she didn't like it on her skin, she, she would complain immediately. Tags, all of that kind of stuff. We eventually had yeah. to get things that were tagless because she didn't like them. Well, I'm going back to where the town, my, my hairdresser's in my parents' old hometown. And they, have, they still have a Kmart there for I don't know how much longer. And I know that's where my mom bought a lot of her pants. So I think I'll pop over there and see if I can find some of this awful old There people. you go. In the smallest yeah. size they can or just, just take uh, a seam down the, <laughs> yeah. down the back yeah. to get the... Uh, well, I know the what size. Down. I think she was like at a two when my mm. sister bought her pants. So she's put on three pounds since the dog left. <laughs> oh. Um, she's eating good. all the table scraps from the residents <laughs> that the dog yeah. used to eat. Yeah. <laughs> eating the dog, all their food now. And they don't have, they don't even serve them big portions. So no. I don't, I don't know how they yeah. all didn't starve and the dog just kept getting fatter, but oh. I'm going to try that because one of the suggestions too was, you know, find like basically the same sweater or one that's super similar. And I think I'll start with that with the pants because, you know, I think that's the other thing is like, she's been wearing these black tops with blue pants, which just makes me crazy because it doesn't work. <laughs> You know, for you I don't, I don't change i don't try to change her clothes because you know at least we're wearing different shirts now yeah so i think i will look for some smaller small yeah. old lady pants because i bet you that's why she's not wearing those gray ones because they're they're skinny legs so they're they the legs touch you know the the legs t- of the pants touch legs of her. Well, and we, my dad would get specific things from Costco. I think he would find specific kinds of pants for my mom and undergarments and things of that sort. But when I tried to get her to wear leggings and she'd be in them and I go, do you like the leggings, mom? And she goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> she would point down to them and she'd go, I, I don't. Stuck and to I me. think Why? it was because they <laughs> hugged her legs. Yeah. And I don't know how sensitive her skin was or just irritated that she can feel it in the pants that she normally wore. She couldn't, you know, she'd wear socks and her tennis shoes and whatnot. And that was not different, you know, but this was different. So she never, she never embraced the leggings, which I thought would have been perfect because they would stay up on her. (laughs) 
<laughs> but uh, yeah. And they double as pajamas if you and want. And pajamas, yeah. Well, you know, you mm. say that and not, I'm like, like scanning visually. I don't think any of the ladies in residence with my mom they wear jeans or the polyester old lady pants. They That's don't awesome. wear leggings or any of that mm-hmm. modern stuff. That's no, funny. they don't. All oh, these it, it was quite interesting. Dad says, don't buy her any more of those things. She liked the tops now. I would get her <clears throat> looser tops that she could wear with her. Um, no collars, no tags, no fuss, no muss, no buttons. Right. She would wear those. And that was 90% of her tops that dad would purchase for her. But the pants always had to be these tacky looking old lady pants. And they were getting. Uh Oh, you froze on me. Are you there? Uh Oh, Uh Oh, Oh, Nope, I'm still here. I didn't even think about that. Sorry about no, that. Like, no problem. I was like, I was sitting here <laughs> freeze frame. I'm like, okay, what happened? Yeah, you were too. Yeah. And I went, uh oh, I think we've lost something here. Yeah. We were we were all in a ha ha and then everything just shut down. That's right. You're like stop talking about old lady pants. <laughs> <laughs> the internet's oh my you know, gosh. out to get us because of old lady pants. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was going to ask you guys one quick question, and then I was going to let you go with the rest of your day. Okay. okay. Now, the internet was just slightly ahead of me. <laughs> um, what advice would you give for people whose family members are maybe in the earlier or middle stages so they can avoid some of the, the heartache that I've gone through? It sounds like you guys, you guys got your committee together, which really helped a lot. If if anything, I would say you need to rally. You need to rally together right. because this shouldn't be something that's done alone. alone. Um, it may have begun that way with um, your father or your mother, or but people need to help. You need to support. That's what the family unit is all about. And there are going to be things that some people can handle, some people can't, and and as a group you can get through all of that. And you need to be aware too, because, you know, this is a learning experience for the young, the mid part, you know, midlife, whatever, because you still have a family member, maybe like we do, that he's not going to be there to take care of himself. We're going to have to step in to do that. So you better educate yourself and make it known to the family members that, you know, I'm going to need you to help me when it comes time for grandpa. Yeah. And in our case right now, we're rallying again for Aunt Mary. Right. Um, so it's another learning experience uh, for that. Um, and my dad is nowhere near there to need help. He's sound mind physically. Right. He's doing just fine moving on um, with, with living his life as best he can at his age right now. And so, you know, but it, it is going to be something that we can't ignore. So yeah. you might as well get your unit together now and learn as you go and, and be engaged with it. Um, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy, but you're going to have to deal with it and, and communicate. Yeah. I, to communicate that, that was going to be my, my addition to that is um, talk about it. You know, with with your loved one, as as you see some of the signs, like bring it up, keep it a, a part of the sort of open line of communication mm-hmm. um, to try to help remove some of the stigma and shame that we might feel about having to deal with losing our memory or being embarrassed or whatever. Like mm-hmm. the more you talk about it, the more you make it more of a normal and learn you know about thing it, and yeah. and yeah, learn learn Education about the things the and and stay open about the 
you know, what's going on. Right. Uh, the easier it will be to transition into a care facility, the easier it will be to figure out ways that are best, you know, figure out better strategies for, you know, whether or not we age out at home or, you know, whether we even need a facility or, you know, whatnot, like really removing this sort of stigma of like, you know, speaking in another room about like, is mom, you know, losing her memory or, you know, whatever being more open about it, I think will help everyone in the long run too. Mm -hmm. I agree. And then that leads to the community committees. Well, and, and as you, know, you make your committee, it's my favorite word because it is yeah. so what it is, you know, it is, um, be very mindful and honest too in that group setting of where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and you can help each other. Um, and, and we did. Divide and um, my sister-in-law is mm. so strong and so level-headed that she helped guide me, who wasn't at the time, you know, to be able to see different perspectives and to sort of level out to focus on what we needed to do. Um, so everybody brought something to the table. And again, um, it was created a couple years ago, and now we're moving forward to help the cousins that have come into the committee to help other family members. Um, Cause it just doesn't go away. You can't not deal with it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Now, quick question on the committee. Was there any, for lack of a better term, like negative family dynamics? Cause I know a lot of people and I've heard horror stories and my sister and I weren't close and we've thankfully navigated taking care of mom and doing what we need to do well, which is great. But I know there are some people whose, you know, sibling doesn't help or, you know, there just seems to be that negative family dynamic that I can almost hear somebody going, oh, well, that's great for them. Their family all sounds great, but my family is a pain <laughs> in the butt. Exactly. And, and at our situation, it was not an issue. Um, we, we knew what needed to happen. Um, we knew what we needed to do yeah. as a group. Um, but more or less, more, more or less. Yeah. yeah, we were learning at the same time as well. There, there were still struggles, you know, too uh, on, on that on that front as well. But like, I, I think re really the, the committee has to be volunteer, you know, like it, and it also has to be um, understanding of, you know, like the, the different personal comfort levels and thresholds that the different members of the committee have right. towards what they are they're willing to take on. Right. You know, where, where you'll get a lot of pushback and struggle is when you're trying to expect that one, you know, person in your family who, you know, isn't going to be able to, you know, call a bunch of facilities and whatnot and putting that responsibility on them. Right. And it you doesn't, know, it don't doesn't make them do anybody yeah. to put judgment um, or, you know, try to force the situation, even though it does put a burden on everyone else. Um, and it's something that just has to be dealt with that at the time, you know, my, my approach would be then fine. I understand, but we got to move on here. So if you're ready to come in at a certain, another time, that's great. But we, we got to do something about this now. Or decisions and, need to be and made right now. now we can't deal with um, the hesitation, the hesitation or, yeah. right now. So, it, but wow. it's not a judgment. It is where you are right now. Um, and you deal with it then. Yeah. yeah so, Keep expectations reasonable. Mm -hmm. Right. Or no expectations at all. <laughs> you you yeah. deal it out because we're adults and you you say, this is what we need to do now. We don't have a choice. And educate everybody as best you can. And it's up to everybody else to decide what you are going to do. It, it we can't force people to do something. I, I think I think too like being able, like d discussing the fact and like coming to terms with the fact that like it's going to get uncomfortable. Yes. You know? I'm saying it's not easy. It's, it's, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to feel awkward about, you know, having to make these decisions about like your, your parent the or your feelings that you're having whatever, about that you know? are very valid. Yes. Um, and, and to acknowledge each other, you know, in your support, community as well. I think that helps relax some of that. And then people are more apt to sort of pick the ball up and, right. and run with it. You know? And that's where we are with my aunt's care right now right. is that we're trying to acclimate new members to the committee to make them feel like they're not alone. 
um, in the process. Um, we're not quite sure that they, well, the one is aware of what they've actually bitten off. Yeah. What, what <laughs> yeah. have they gotten exactly. To? Um, and so we're trying to help with that um, as best we can right now. And that's the awkward part. Yeah. And yeah. it's okay. And it's yeah. okay. okay. It does feel sometimes like mom has memory loss and it seems to have sucked up a lot more of my time, even though she's in a community. Right. I'm just shocked at how much time I my deal with My dad said the stuff. same thing. Yeah. He goes, I'm more involved now than I was when she was living here. But he well, goes, it's, it's in a different, true. it's, different. Yeah. it's in yeah. a different capacity, but he goes, I wouldn't have it any other way. I know she's safe. Right. I yeah. know that he's being taken he, care of. He can dedicate more active time to specific things. Whereas to, before he, he was 24 right. seven, but whether he acknowledges it that, you know, he was 24 mm seven, -hmm. you know, and, and felt like even the passive times he is, he was being, right. you know, um, a caregiver, mm -hmm. you know, even when she's sleeping or when, you know, well, I think it's important to know that even though you do put someone in a care facility, your caregiving responsibilities, unless you just walk away from it are not over. That's not recommended. Right. Um, you know, there are other things that you either choose to have them do or they inform you need for yeah. you to do for them to cut costs or whatever the case may be like the clothing for your mother or the items that she, her toiletries and all of those things that at a cost, you could get them to do them for you. Uh, but my dad chose not to, he chose to have them text him or call him when they needed um, him to do shopping for her. And he went and visited her several times a week um, to make sure that the items that he was purchasing were being used and where her inventory, you know, he just kept tabs on them and her yeah you know keeping tabs really, on those stuff is a challenge keeping tabs yeah. and also making his presence known with the staff there too that i'm aware of her care literally <laughs> so um if there's an issue i'm gonna kind of let you know <laughs> yeah and he had some meetings where he pulled in the leadership and said i'm not happy with this can we see if we can make a change not just for my wife, but for everybody else here. Yeah. Yeah, that's like when I, I didn't have the new memory care director's email. So I emailed the executive director of the entire community and said, I don't have her email, so please forward this to her. I didn't want him to think I was complaining about them. And that was all about mom's shower. I'm like, trust me, everybody will be a lot happier if you put her back in the morning. Right, Which right. Which means this gal that comes in, I mean, she gets off at 2.30, so I'm not, you got to back up like eight and a half hours, and I can't do that math in my head, but she gets there really early, because she was saying, well, your mom's getting up at like five o'clock, and I'm like, in the morning? I was like, that's oh. not my mom, so I don't, that's kind of going to be one of my next steps, is to, to kind of gently quiz them on why they think she might be getting up so early, because it is really out of character, is it just part of the progression of the disease or my mom started doing that they had to put an alarm on her bed she would come out of her room and wander the halls at two three four o'clock in the morning and uh, they would find her just wandering and so they ended up having to put an alarm so that the gal they would hear that she was moving in her room to go assist her to if she would needed to go use the restroom or whatever, or that they would watch her door to see if she was indeed coming out and wandering the halls. And that was, you know, probably five, six months into her stay there. Something to look forward to. Yay. Yes. Yeah, so she always had an alarm. It, was it all so, sounds so fun, doesn't it? Well, it is, it <laughs> progresses. And it's, it's in, like I said, it's an, it's, it's sad, but it is something that does progress. Um, once it starts progressing, it progresses rapidly into completely different things that you yeah. wouldn't think. You know, my yeah. dad was always on his toes thinking, oh, okay, this week we're doing this yeah, now. Yeah, now we're dealing with this. Yeah. And, you know, where's your baby doll? What baby doll are you talking about? We don't you know? care about the baby anymore. She had to yeah. have it, and now she doesn't remember, you know. Yeah. So he says it's constantly changing. And, you know, he said, I just feel bad for her, for her mind. You know, it must be a mess in there of her trying to remember, or try to think, and 
it's happening just as fast for her in her head. Yeah. But she's losing more every time, you know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to ever know if they're aware of what's going on. I think in the beginning you are. But like right. now where literally my mom doesn't remember one or two minutes ago, which is right. really weird. But if that's, that's your life, if that's all you re are used to at this point, then maybe it's not so bad. But I don't, I don't want, I don't think I want to know if she's aware that, that her mind is just going. I mean, yeah. she makes that comment, oh, my memory's not what it used to be. And trust me, it's really hard not to laugh when she says that. Right, and right. Once she leaned over toward me and I was recording at the time, and she's like, well, I guess senility is just setting in. I was like, okay. Oh, <laughs> I did, dear. I did Bless leave that hard. Yeah, I left that little clip in on that episode because I'm like, <laughs> I should almost just put that at the end of each episode. <laughs> it is. It's just, it's, it's a hard thing to understand, to really fully understand. And you would hope that maybe they're shielded from that. I, I think they probably are, but sometimes I, I wonder and I worry and then I have to kind of just put that aside and say, you know, there isn't anything I can do about that, and I do everything I can for her. I, I take her out regularly and get her nails done, which is probably time again. And, you know, I take her to the regional park. And, we, and when we were coming back this current week, she said, I said, well, you know, it's the end of October, so we, we have to enjoy our time outside while we still can. And her response was funny because she goes, well, yes, or somebody else will. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting perspective. Mm. And then I said, well, maybe when it's colder, because, you know, you guys are in the San Diego area, right? Uh, Orange County. Orange County. Okay. okay. So I'm up in the San Francisco Bay area. So our winters get kind of nippy and a little wet usually, hopefully. And I said, well, maybe if it's not too cold and we can come out with blankets and sit. And she loves to watch the sky. Mm. She's always commenting about the blue sky. And then the other day it was the blue water and the blue sky. And she said, Oh, that might be nice, which will be interesting to see if she actually agrees to do it. And then I said, well, bring a mug, you know, a, a, a thermos of hot chocolate. She goes, that sounds really good. And I'm like, okay, well I'll try that maybe early December before it gets, we get um, Thule fog, which is yes. cold. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, it might only be 50 degrees, but that fog is just damp and it just penetrates your bones and she doesn't yeah. have any fat on her. So <laughs> I'd have to bring many blankets to keep her warm. So we'll try it. If she, we'll see if she's game. Right. You no, know, at least the, the, um, grand reopening of the community, the assisted living and the memory care is November 8th. So they're 99% done with that. Thank God. That's good. That's a lot of turmoil for all those poor, poor people seeing changes that they don't understand what's going on and making things a little bit unfamiliar, I would imagine. Yeah. There's some choices they made like in their TV viewing area. They used to have like, they were almost like um, medicinal type medical grade um, recliners. Mm -hmm. Like I would think the kind that you'd have like in an infusion clinic. And they got rid of all those. They have these nice couches and chairs. Well, they don't really have any place for the wheelchair-bound residents. And the way the management, I'm assuming it's the corporate end, wants it arranged is very nice. It looks very pretty, but it's not at all practical for the memory care. Oh, boy. And I'm like, you know, okay, so corporate's telling you this way, which isn't really working. And if, So there's some choices they made I don't really get. So, yeah, and they'll figure it out once they aesthetically, they probably want it to look nice for the opening, but as they use it, they'll make changes. I'm sure they'll I have to, so. yeah. I would hope so. Cause I mean, the medicinal, you know, medical grade recliners were not, I mean, they were bone white color and I mean, they weren't pretty at all, but they were practical. Yeah. yeah. And I know like when my, I toured the community first because the plans my sister and I had been discussing, I had realized, well, I don't think this is going to work the way we think. And I went and toured it and I was very impressed. And when, when she and I went together, you know, she made comments like, 
Well, in the assisted living dining room, you know, there's flowers and pretty things on the tables. Well, in the memory care, they're blank. It's like cafeteria looking. And she's like, well, there's nothing pretty on the tables here. And I'm like, well, one, these people are going to just take them. I mean, there's one gal there that they're, she actually tried to steal my mom's dog. So oh, no. <laughs> she had wow. decided that day the dog was hers and she was not happy that I was putting the dog in my mom's room. So I'm like, I understood why they didn't have all these pretty things on the table. and Yeah, you know, less is more. Exactly. Less confusing. I can, I can see from a corporate marketing standpoint that you, know, you want it to look beautiful and nice because why would you want to put your loved one in some place that looks dumpy? But, well, because that's the first room they show you is the activity room too when you tour. True. Well, there's because there's this rectangle. Well, it's like I said, it's a square with the courtyard in the middle. Depending on which side you walk in on, either the first room you see is the TV viewing area, or if you walk in on the other side, it would be the activity area slash secondary dining room. Mm -hmm. Now that it's all put back together, I'm hoping when I go this coming tomorrow, um, it'll all be put together because it was a tiny bit frustrating. We had to rehome the dog in the second week of August, and they still hadn't replaced all the carpet as of two weeks ago. Oh, maybe wow. Maybe even last week. But, of course, the carpet they changed was right in front of my mom's door. That got done first. So it all, you know, it all worked out fine. But, you know, I'm glad they won't be renovating again while my mom's there, I hope. Hopefully. Exactly. Yeah. You know? And it was getting, there was, if you looked closely in the kitchenette where they, they get the meals ready for the memory care people. There was some dry rod and just some stuff that was like, okay, this place isn't cheap. And some of this stuff's getting a little uh, run down. Right. And they ripped everything out. They ripped out all the cabinets and the, everything in the kitchenette. They ripped out the tile around the fireplace in the TV room. I'm like, really? I never even saw what the old tile looked like because my mom doesn't, <laughs> doesn't watch TV. She doesn't track the shows. She just doesn't interest her. And, yeah, it's just been it's been a very interesting journey with her, and she's almost seventy six, so we might have a long journey ahead of us. Oh, bless her heart! Yeah. So, but tomorrow we get to go to the dentist. <laughs> oh boy, my dad said mom never had an issue going to the dentist, and really? she didn't know. She never did. She did. Ev she did what dad told her to do. That's crazy. She trusted him implicitly. Implicitly. But if, of all the to, like sort of micro fears that she had. Like the dentist they was sort one of, them? of well, you know, as she's as she lost her memory, those fears sort of got away from her. Uh, she was just fearful when she didn't see dad. That was her lifeline. But he could take her to go to the dentist to go get her hair cut, um, shopping with him, and she would just stick right by him. She wanted to push the cart, you know, um, and you know, gave him you know grief a little bit i can do it jim you know this that and the other thing but uh oh, yeah. for the most part and and that's the kind of relationship he has with aunt mary too he's the only one that can get her into a car to go anywhere interesting well this will be yeah. our fourth dentist trip she's very cooperative i mean and the yeah. dentist is literally like two two miles from my house or slightly less so i have to like mm -hmm. drive over and get mom I'm all the way back this way. And yeah. then it's like, I might go across the street. There's a tea place I really like, coffee and tea place. It's an independent. And you know how most of those never survive with Starbucks and Pete's. But this one's doing great. So I might go over there and yeah. do something. And her facility else. doesn't have people that come in to see the patients or the residents? Not for dentistry. Oh. Her, her okay. health insurance, they constantly call me. It's driving me bananas. Because they have a... Um, home visit program and her doctor left the practice. So two weeks ago we had to go establish a new relationship with a new doctor in the group. And mm -hmm. I was like, why do I need to bring her? <laughs> uh, yeah, really. Cause they uh, did have, I think they had dental or they had medical that came in for mom. Um, and I did, I think they did have a dentist that came in to just do quick checks. But at that point, you know, a lot of them didn't have a whole lot to look at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, my, well, my mom's had always had really soft teeth, but she's been doing really good. But I noticed last week that the toothbrush that was on her vanity, 
the the little vanity organizer with the toothbrush and all that stuff and it did disappeared oh so no i have no idea i'm she had lots of toothbrushes so i'm hoping that since they didn't call me and say oh your mom needs toothbrushes I'm assuming that they had spare ones someplace for her. Maybe they put it under her sink because my mom had a sink that had a lock on it. Yeah, hers does too. Pretty much took everything off of, she didn't have anything on tables or in the bathroom and they had a key. Maybe they put it under. Yeah, I'm going to have to ask him. It's like, can I get a copy of this key so I can like put the toilet paper and all that stuff away? My dad had one. He had one okay. so he could look to see. So yeah, it's not unreasonable. That's right. He actually said he made one and told them, I'm making a key because it's not a hard thing to make. Mm. But he, he had his own key and they went, okay, because he they knew. And it should be what every family member does that comes in there to check. I would, when we would go. We'd see mom, we'd go down to her room, one would stay with her, I'd go down and just check her room to mm -hmm. see if her hamper was in her closet, to see if her clothes were there, to see how clean her room was. And I was always pleasantly surprised. They did a very good job. Yeah. My mom's housekeeping day is Tuesday, and when I go on Mondays, it's like, when I moved her bed to put the new duvet cover on, I'm like, yeah, there could be a little more vacuuming under here. They have like the vinyl... Um, wood vinyl floors, mm -hmm. but for the most part, you know, considering she had the dog, and I go the day before cleaning. It's always I'm always pretty impressed. So, yeah, we would yeah. go on Saturdays, and that was Mom's cleaning day. Mm. So they would do it early in the morning, and when we walked in, it was spick and span clean. Her clothes were always clean because uh, laundry day was before that. So, um, yeah, I was very happy. Um, satisfied knowing she was cared for well yeah it's a hard a hard job for them to do and mm -hmm. I know um, a friend of mine whose mom was in the same community with my mom um, she was like I don't know why they have to spend all this money on the renovations when they need to pay these people more so they can get more staff because that's always been a challenge there's like a core group of ladies that have been there the whole time my mom's been there and they're great and then these other people come in and after three to six months, they're, they're gone. Yeah. And I, I, I don't blame them. They don't get paid a lot. And it's the nature of the occupation. Yeah, it's hard. That was the challenge with the in-home care. Yeah. Yeah. That I'm glad that that was just a very temporary thing. It was the frustration my dad had as it goes, you know, I think I had in that short amount of time, four or five people that took care of your mom and it would confuse her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't good for her to, to go through that. So I kept having to remind him it's, it's, it's a bridge. Um, and we are only using this temporarily until we can actually get more consistent care for her. But he did say it was, that was frustrating to know they wouldn't show up sometimes or they would send somebody different. We had a service um, while my dad was on hospice and they were great. We did have to tell um, the management, like one gal that worked in the afternoons, because my dad was diabetic and he wasn't getting dialysis, there were things that happened physically that were gross. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. one, one young gal wouldn't deal with it. Oh. And dealing with my dad was a challenge as it was. So I just had to say, you know what, if she can't deal with this edema leaking out of, you know, it was gross. Um, she can't come back. And the biggest regret I have is my brother-in-law worked different hours. So he would go check in on the evening, the, the, I think it were 11 PM to 7 AM person, the overnight person. Mm -hmm. But at, at the very end, it was, it was obvious that she wasn't doing her job because the hospice nurse showed up one morning and my dad was soaked and sitting in a puddle and according to the report she had changed him like an hour before two hours before and actually it was the uh, the other caregiver and she was so disgusted she called the hospice nurse and the hospice nurse called and yelled at me because we're paying all this money for these people and they're not doing their job I'm like I can't supervise them 24 hours a day right so it was that was you know people say well I want to age in place I want to die in my home this is not always a good thing because right. the last week of my dad's life was rough. And part of it was not great care. 
And then, you know, just, it went from, I wasn't sure when he was going to go because I had seen him and I gave him a big hug. I told him I loved him and that was on a Friday and I think it was the following Thursday he was gone. Mm. It went, it went quick at the end, but yeah, the in-home caregiving is, that's even worse. So I'd rather than be at a, an accredited facility. Um, they don't have any rules. We can go any time of day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. And because I go the same day, I go after our rotary meeting. They have a tendency to know, oh, it's uh, getting, must be about time for Jen to show up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I do, sometimes I'll do errands and then go. Sometimes if we don't have rotary lunch before we don't have a meeting that day, I'll show up and have lunch with them. So I try to keep them on their toes a little bit. Right, <laughs> right. You know, my sister That's- goes weekends. Mm-hmm. That's you know. when we would go. We would go on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, but my mom, when she started falling out of bed oh, towards dear. the end there, they did put her on hospice watch is what they called it in, in the community on the second floor. And so for probably two, two and a half months, she was under hospice care until she got some intestinal and she got sick. Um, she got sick with some intestinal contagious thing mm. and then they, they had to take her out because it was a contagious deal and put her in a sniff. Um, and consequently that's where she passed away and it's not uncommon. Yeah. That's what my mom's got a neurology appointment on. I remember December. what it was called. And did we lose our connection again? Nope, nope, I can oh, hear okay. you. You guys, you guys froze up for a second there. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping with the neurology appointment, they'll be able to kind of guide my sister on to, you know, is my mom going to live to 91 like her mom? Is it, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we can get some sort of educated guess on a timeline. Because mm-hmm. like I said, she's so physically fine. Right. You know, she's not going to go that way. No. So it's it's going to be the Alzheimer's that gets her unless she gets pneumonia or something. You know, and I know they'll do hospice care there unless obviously if something like that happens. So yeah. <sighs> so, many, so much journey left to walk. It is. And, you know, they'll know. They'll know and they'll let you know. Um, yeah. My dad was surprised. And when he told me that we he had talked to the facility, um, uh, gal there at crescendo and she suggested hospice and i immediately went to what and he goes no 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 there are levels of hospice yeah and i was not aware of that hospice sort of sounds like a four-letter word right know. so so they <clears throat> and they actually bring in a hospice person that is assigned and takes care of them 24 7 for all of her needs and they're basically were concerned because she was getting up and falling you know she was she was um she was in in a place where she could hurt herself. And so they made sure they got her a hospice bed uh, with uh, bars on it so that she couldn't, she couldn't get out of bed on her own. And of course the alarms were different on the bed, you know, in case she decided to climb over the bars, but she wasn't um, strong enough to do that, but they did an excellent job. And that's how, you know, they do then monitor other physical things um, that, that come about. And, and know the stages that they're going through and let you know. Yeah, that's the one thing with, and how long was your mom at her community? She was there. We got, we put her in July of 2017 and she was there until the last week of June. It's almost year. a year. It's om- almost, almost a year. A year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, My day. mom has been there, let's see, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. So seven 19 months. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom was at a level though that she was, she probably should have been put there two years prior. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Mentally, I think my mom probably should have also, but she's, they have six levels of care and she's at level two. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, but it's sad to see the people who have had to move out because their families run out of money. Right. And- there was one day I was there and this um, man and woman were, they were kind of hustling personal items out and I, and they just looked very agitated and I was like kind of concerned as to what was going on. And then I found out that 
their father had passed away over the weekend. Oh. And I guess, I don't know, I forget exactly how the money works, um, but they wanted to make sure to get his stuff out. I mean, you have till the end of the month, and I don't remember what time of the month it was, so maybe maybe that's why they were hustling, but he had been, he was, he had been in pretty bad shape. His name was Richard, and he was very tall, and uh, he was, he was hard. Because he had no no memory at all, and no, it was it was like trying to control a one year old that was six and a half feet tall. Mm-hmm. It was very difficult. So, but it's that's the one thing when you go all the time, and to see the changes in the residents, it's like oh yeah yeah, it's so exactly exactly. Uh, there was a story my dad was saying that we had last Christmas. There was a gal sitting next to me. I was helping her while I was helping my mom, and he was telling me that she had passed away. And she was talking to me at Christmas time last year. So he said that um, she was a next door neighbor, I guess, to my mom and that she had passed probably a month prior to my mom getting sick. So it constant changing, constant different things and different levels as you get to know everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a challenge. Well, I've sucked up all of your late morning, early afternoon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, this has been nice. It's been uh, it's been quite um, good for me to talk about this too. Yeah, well, I'm glad. Yeah, and it's and I love the fact that you guys have this committee. I think that's fantastic. I think that that should become a a key thing in this process because no one should have to do this alone. Definitely, and it's an affectionate um, a, in our family. It's an affectionate term to to just say we're not alone in this. Everybody has a voice. Yeah. I think the the committee doesn't have, doesn't necessarily have to be like immediate family either. No. You know, your, your committee <clears throat> is, is your, your sounding board, your, you know, the people that you trust the most. It could be very close friends. It could be, you know, family, it could be whatever. That help you make those decisions. That help you make those decisions to help you sort of figure out like what, what is the experience. best course of, of, mm-hmm. of action, you know. Um, I think that's important in general for life, like to have your committee, but right. for making these decisions um, in, in you know, your older life and in your parents' older life and, and whatnot, it's, it's a really valuable and thing to have. And for kids and their mothers and fathers to have conversations now when we can tell you. Yeah. As opposed I'm, to waiting when you can't. And making really inappropriate, morbid jokes about our own death. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's one thing. When my dad was on hospice, I don't even remember how it came up, but, and I've made this comment before. I'm like, they, the hospice people said, you know, your morbid sense of, humor is really refreshing and i thought i'm not sure that's a compliment <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wait a minute here this is like oh, the funeral home director telling you that oh my um, gosh yeah i don't I was know like, if you can't laugh you you know that well, is true. yeah it is and what you're doing here is quite um extraordinary too i mean too. for people to be able to tune in and privately listen to other people's stories to get a handle on where they are with it as well. well and not feel alone because now there's this, uh, this whole community Ex- that's exactly. talking about it. Yeah, exactly. That, Oh, that I'm feeling that, or, Oh my gosh, this is scary. And I'm scared. And you were too. It's, it's, it's really good. So, well, and it's so on, on demand. Oh, you're welcome. Because when I started trying to find ways to connect with my mom, because all of the, you know, tried and true methods, you know, bring the old family photo album, play music, do this. None of that worked. And I'm like, I can't come every week and have her ask me every, you know, five minutes, two minutes, you know, so what have you been up to today? So what have you been up to today? And when we do get into that loop, I'll answer, well, I went to the gym and then she'll ask me again. Okay, well, I went to Rotary and, you know, then she'll ask me a third time. I'm like, oh, well, at Rotary, such and such person talked about whatever, you know, mm-hmm. then she'll ask me again, but there was a, a couple weeks ago, she, she looked at me and she said, so what have you been up to? Probably not a lot, right? And oh, I was like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, let's see. I have the podcast and the photography business. I do all the social media for my businesses. My husband's a realtor and a um, property manager. He's running for city council. I try to go to the gym regularly. 
and we try to cook food. And I'm like, what do you mean? Not much. I'm exhausted. <laughs> right. But there's no understanding of that. No, there's and it was absolutely just absolutely no understanding. And you just look at her and go, not much. No, yeah, no, I, I haven't mean, been doing we're much. We're getting more. by. I'm good. <laughs> we're well, good. I told we're her, happy. <laughs> I told her what I was doing just because I was just so shocked. But I try to right. come up with various I try to vary the answers, but going out and going to the, the parks or going and watching the kids play or even, you know, doing little errands and getting a snack, that all seems so much better. So I'm, I try to do that as much as possible because I know at some point she may not be able to just get in and out of the car on her own and right. all that so stuff. Important. You're, yeah. you're fortunate to be able to do that now. Yeah. Like I said, she's, she'll be 76 in the middle of January. So she's young-ish. Right. And, you know, but the, the trying to find ways to connect and doing these deep internet research dives, you know, first I'd get a headache and I right. wasn't getting any answers. So I went and looked on, you know, iTunes for an Alzheimer's podcast and there really aren't many. Mm -hmm. And there's one that's been around a long time and it didn't work for me for a lot of reasons. So I'm like, well, what the hell? No, I'll just there do you it. go. Well, yeah. this is great. This is it's, great. And I'm glad to have been a part of it. I'm, I'm glad to have had you guys this afternoon. Yeah, thanks for having us. You're welcome. And I'm going to...